Hi, I'm François René Rideau, and today I'm going to tell you about computing versus computers, the Hunem point of view. So this talk is based on my blog, Hunem Computing, which is itself based on my old Tunes project, which is some of the finest um, vaporware never written from the 1990s. <laughs> my take home point is that you should think in terms of computing, that is, interactions of which you are part, and not in terms of artifacts, which is like software or hardware devices uh, under you, where you are a god above. I will tell you a lot about orthogonal persistence, which is uh, how I think systems should, uh, a property I think should, systems should have. And I will tell you about reflective systems and first class computations, which is uh, how I believe a system should be architected. And my bigger take home point is that a change in point of view uh, on what computing is will change what software you write. That's the plan of my talk. And let's start with Hunan and Yahoo's. So the other day, I was with my friend Anne, <coughs> and I wanted to install Overtone. Overtone is a music, uh, interactive music software, which is written in Clojure. And Clojure is written uh, in, in uh, Clojure is written in Java, so I had to install the JVM, so Clojure JVM. To inst interact with Clojure, you need Emacs. Uh, Clojure, uh, no, Overtune uses SuperCollider, real-time music system to actually uh, output real-time uh, sounds. <coughs> and all of it is running on Windows. So I want to install Overtone, and actually I, I need to install like six different pieces of software. Okay. Issue, not only do I have to, to hunt for all these files online, including configuration files to correctly configure uh, Emacs to run uh, with Clojure, but Clojure and Emacs disagreed on where the home directory was. Emacs was convinced that uh, its home directory was in the local app data thing, and Is it better now? Okay, so Clojure thought that the home directory was the user profile directory, the Windows user profile directory, and Emacs thought that the home directory was the local app data directory, which is obviously different. So we had to figure out why did we change uh, .emacs and it doesn't do anything. And of course, in the end, after we installed all those things, managed to configure Emacs, managed to configure Clojure, everything, it still failed because the super collider binary distribution was 32-bit and the JVM was 64-bit. So in the end, after half an hour and an hour, we said, stop it, we'll use Linux. Linux was just as hard to make work, but I had managed to make it work before. And uh, the main problem was Pulse Audio versus JackD, uh, sound daemons, incompatible, etc. Um, for the people that just come in, would we be able to restart so I can, like, fix the audio? Sure, let's, yeah, okay, let's restart. That was my first, uh, well, my first. Okay, there's a lot of people. Come in where you can. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Tell me when you're ready. Okay, ready. Okay. Hi, I'm François René Rideau, and today I'm going to tell you about computing versus computers, the Hunem point of view. <coughs> this talk is based on my blog, Hunem Computing, and which is itself based on my old Tunes project, some of the finest vaporware never written from the 1990s. My main point is that you should think in terms of computing, not in terms of computers in terms of interactions of which you are part uh, at the same level as humans and not in terms of software below humans that are just devices and artifacts, uh, hardware or software below us. I will discuss orthogonal persistence, which is a property I think every operating system should have. And I will uh, briefly describe reflective systems and first class computations, which is how I believe uh, systems should be architected. And my larger uh, point, uh, that I want to make is that changing your point of view will change what software you write. 
that's in the plan of my talk also. And let's start with Winans and Yahoo's. The other day, I was with my friend N, and I wanted to install Overtone, which is an interactive music system written in Clojure. So I install Overtone, I need to install Clojure, which I need to in install Emacs to interact with. I also need to insta install Super Collider, which is a real-time music backend, uh, language, etc., plat development platform of its own. And Clojure runs on the JVM, and everything runs on Windows. So I have to install five different systems that run on top of Windows. And of course, it never works. You have to hunt like for files online. I think it's an issue in itself. And Clojure saw that its home was a user profile directory of uh, Windows. Like most people might think your home is that. But the, at least this version of Emacs was convinced that the home was in local app data. So we, we could modify the .emacs. It changed nothing until we figured, oh, actually, they disagree to, as to where the .emacs is. And in the end, it still didn't work because Super Collider was distributed as a 32-bit installer or something, and the JVM was 64-bit, so it never worked, and we uh, dropped the thing. Of course, in the end, uh, we made it work on Linux, which was a lot of work, too, because of uh, the issue with the sound daemon JackD versus Pulse Audio that Ubuntu uses. And it required quite a lot of manual configuration, but in the end, we had something that worked. And if it's not a solution, I think that it was at least a scriptable, reproducible workaround. So my friend and started asking questions like, how do you trust random programs from people you have no relationship with? And how can programs disagree on the home deal or on the ABI? And if they disagree, how, can, how come you have to dig through log files to figure out what is happening being a super advanced uh, programmer instead of the system telling you, hey, there's an incompatibility there? And why do you need to configure anything at all? Why isn't just there a same default, you install it, it just works? What is this concept of files? And why do you have to redo everything on every machine? Why are there like five different develop or six different de development platforms? Why can't you do it with just one? And why do anyone but the developer of any of these items have to worry about anything? Why can't I just be like, I install it, it just works? And you will think, oh, my friend N is pretty ignorant. I mean, <laughs> how, how ignorant of how things work. That, that's how it works. But these questions are not stupid either. And you say, my friend N does not how computing happens in the human world. And yet, I would argue that my friend is N is a computing expert, just not a human expert, a Huynam expert. And what are Huynams? Do you remember this guy, Gulliver? He's a guy who is famous for making lots of uh, travels by sea, and every time he had a, a shipwreck. So don't travel with this guy. <laughs> his most famous travel was in the land of Lilliput, very tiny people, and his last travel was in the land of Huynams. And Huynams are the sentient uh, beings that are equines. They look like horses, but don't call them horses. Horses are stupid, dirty, filthy animals that are not sentient. And you wouldn't, be, uh, you wouldn't like to be confused for a yahoo, and a yahoo is th those stupid, non-sentient, uh, filthy animals that uh, Huynams use as beasts and cattle. So. All these stories were told by Jonathan Swift in a book, but don't trust all the detail of that book because he used it for social commentary. So, he, he, so my, my friend, uh, I called her an N because that's simpler. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she was a computer scientist in Huynam land, and she had heard, like everyone, the story of this Gulliver, and she didn't believe it because she thought it was just all made up for social commentary. And she decided to prove that this story was totally impossible, and it's impossible to travel by, uh, by sailing to a land where there were lots of humans. But then she found a flaw in her proof. So being an honest and uh, obsessed uh, computer scientist, she decided to go all the, all the way through the end of uh, this flaw in the proof, and she ended up sailing to our land. And happily for her, she was not uh, as bad a sailor as Gulliver. And happily for her, uh, equines are not treated very well in our lands. And then she was enslaved, as most equines are, and she evaded the knacker, where equines that uh, are not docile end up, and she also end, uh, evaded, even worse, a government research facility, where equines that displayed any kind of sentience are sent. Happily for her, she was rescued by the French resistance. <laughs> <laughs> And that's how she ended up uh, in a barn somewhere connected on IRC. And that's, that's how I, I met her. And she told, she told me her story. And we became best friends. And, 
and now she likes uh, to ask me lots of questions about how humans do computing because uh, while she's staying with us, she's doing comparative studies in hu human versus Wynnum computing. Okay, one thing, some things you need to know about Wynnum computing. There is no such a thing as magical things for Wynnum. They don't have magic powers, they don't have oracles, they don't have anything beyond Turing com computability, they don't have quantum computers, they don't have super duper fast computers, they just have basically the same general technology as we do. But one thing they, they do have that we don't is a point of view in terms of computing, not in terms of computers. Which means that, well, I will describe, I'll describe in detail what that means, but they, they have a different point of view on computing, and it's a distinction note about how to write software. Uh, functional programming is just as valid or invalid for Huynhams as it is for us, but it's a distinction about what software you will want to write or not to write. In the point of view of computing, computers are means, they are not ends. Dijkstra famously said, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. And uh, Huynhams would agree on that with Dijkstra, except that I believe Dijkstra to the extra, computing was a way to explore pure mass. And for Huynhams, pure mass are very important, but more important than mass is meat. That is, computing is a tool to uh, build interactions in which sentient beings are involved, Huynhams or humans, assuming humans are sentient. Uh, this is uh, something we'll have to skip. Being a Huynham, uh, my friend N had never seen a keyboard because, you know, with whose keyboard, that doesn't work very well. So she's fascinated by uh, me typing on my Space Cadet keyboard and she watches it for hours and she has a double screen where she can see what's on my screen and what I'm typing. And then she tells me, you know, there is some kind of magic key card that you press at every, every so often. Like, all the time you press this key card and I can't fathom what it's doing because it doesn't have a very visible effect on... on, on and what you're doing. What do you think this magic key card is? Save. Hmm? Save. You've seen my slides? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's not the enter key because that's obvious. It's not control L because I don't do it all the time, but it is indeed control X, control S, which in Emacs is saving the file. And then she asked me, what is this saving files thing? So I have to explain her files. Files are kind of objects, but they are kind of low level because they are specified as a level of bytes. So you go, okay, that's a weird way to specify objects, but okay. And if you don't save a file, then all your changes are lost. And not only that, but you also have to do a daily prayer to back up the god of data recovery, <laughs> who is a very merciful god if you do regular prayers, but a very revengeful and merciless god if you don't. <laughs> so, and says, okay, okay, okay. Uh, so so in what rare and unpredictable events do you try to save your thing uh, against? Like, what kind of dangers do you save things for? And I say, oh, well, I, I can just do a bad click there and I will lose my stuff or I can close my app or my software may crash or I may have a power loss because my laptop is not plugged in or the device may malfunction, it may be lost, it may be stolen, it may be broken, it may just die of old age. And my friend Anne says, oh, but these are not at all unpredictable things. They are like very predictable catastrophes, and the solutions are totally automatable. So why do you save files manually? I say, well, there are historical reasons. Uh, back when I was young, files were big and disks were small, so you, can, you couldn't just save the files any time because otherwise it would run out of disk very fast. And since then, that's how it's always been done. That's all how computer systems are designed. Also, the computer cannot decide when to save a file. If I start to, to cut a big piece of, of code here to paste it there and the system saves it in the middle, I'm, I'm hosed. Or if I start to open the parentheses here and before I uh, close it there with text, the, the thing is saved, then the, some other process may see the wrong thing and everything will be wrong. So I can't let the computer decide that. Also, personally, I've been beaten way too often. I've lost like hours of work uh, not saving things, so now I just uh, control X, control S. It's, it's hardwired, I don't have to think about it, I don't waste like precious neurons on thinking when should I save my file, I just save it. And every time I have a pause in my thought, boom, control X, control S. Yes, so I didn't even notice I was doing it until she told me. And then she told me, okay, 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 actually you have automated it, you just automated it in wetware. You automated it in your brain. 
which is totally opposed to the sacred motto of the Guild of Freedom Programmers, which translated in English is, I object to doing things that computers can do. Indeed, the whole point of computing is to automate the things in the things that works for automation, that is silicon or mechanical devices, and keep the things that cannot be automated in wetware. And sometimes, so the highest goal of computer science is to automate that which can be automated. And sometimes you have to accept defeat. Sometimes things cannot be automated, or it cannot be automated yet, or you don't have the resource to automate it, or it costs too much to automate. That's fine. You have to accept that sometimes you can't automate stuff. That's wisdom, accepting defeat. But when the victory is just at hand, you could just have automated it, and you didn't, and you surrender, that's foolishness. You could just have won, and you lose because you're foolish. That's foolishness. Difference between wisdom and foolishness. So, Huynam systems have what I called orthogonal persistence. I didn't invent the term. Orthogonal persistence is when everything is just saved by default. I type it, it's saved. You know, you open a window, you type A equals one, then you wait five seconds, you put a hammer, you destroy your computer, you burn it to the ground, you dissolve it in acid, you buy a new computer, you log onto it, and the window is still there with A equals one. That's orthogonal persistence. And the general motto is, if it's not worth saving, it's not worth computing. If I didn't mean for it to stay, I wouldn't have typed it on my computer. I would just have thought about it. Hey, it's, it's cheaper. If I typed it on my computer, I probably wanted it to remain and to be there. So think about it another way. Who among you like, spills his registers to, uh, to cash manually, decide when a register gets spilled to L1 cash, L2 cash, L3 cash, RAM? No, you let the computer do it. You automate it. You don't think about it. Why should you have to manually spill your RAM or virtual RAM to disk? And why should you have to spill your disk to a remote backup manually? It can all be automated. That's so simple to automate. Of course, there are modalities. There are, there are, there's a whole range of possible latencies that you may, and quality of services that you may expect. Uh, if you pay a lot and you are connected directly to the internet and you have a stable power supply, then in a few seconds you can have um, replicas all over the world. If you're on a laptop at a conference disconnected in the middle of uh, nowhere, you will not expect to have replicas immediately, and maybe to save power, you will only save stuff to disk every minute. But, so there is a whole range of latencies that cannot be predicted in advance by the programmer or by anyone else than the end user. Space, uh, there is enough space for anything you type. Um, maybe when I was a kid, there wasn't, because computers had a few kilobytes of memory, and uh, recording if a new type was for a few minutes would have taken uh, kilobytes of memory, but today we have like terabytes of memory. There's no reason why any type, key you type should ever be lost, unless you want it to be lost. And you can even record everything you view on your computer, and maybe you don't want to, to record uh, four kilopixels per second, no, 50 times per second, but you just need to, reply, to, to store the small state from which this is comp comp computed. Oh, uh, it's just displaying the game Pac-Man, and this guy did this and that. And there are a, f a finite number of events that matter, those where you input stuff, and there, everything else is predictable, or should be. Uh, and then that's all, the only thing you need to log in your uh, persistence log, everything else can be uh, recomputed from that. So if you have a system that has strict determinism and can replay from a small state, then you don't need to record every frame, and yet you can replay every frame. So you only need to keep high-level events and discard everything that's irrelevant and store those high-level events in the persistent log. There are also issues of privacy. Uh, most of us want the, our persistent log to be private to ourselves. We want to share something with other people. Some things require triple encryption because that's where I store my bank accounts. But other things only require simple encryption. Or maybe not, I don't know. Uh, you, you choose. But the, on, the important point is that the programmer cannot know that. The programmer cannot know in advance whether the program will run on a laptop, a palm top, a desktop, a grid. He cannot know uh, what are the la uh, latency preferences of the end user, uh, how much money he's willing to put on making things persistent with what uh, trade-offs. So in the end, it's the end user who has to decide because the, the programmer can't. And the end user can, uh, can, of course, delegate things to his uh, expert programmer who works for him. But the programmer of the program who does not work for him 
cannot know and cannot make good choices for him. So in an orthogonally persistent system, you will, ha you will want to have a notion of domains of persistence where the programmer can say, hey, this is my work, it's important. This is my play, it's important. This is my porn, I don't want to share it. This is, um, <laughs> this is my bank account, they need to be triple protected. This is where I conspire against the government or against my wife. Uh, <laughs> you, you want to have separate domains for the different things you do. You want probably the, the, the windows to be in different color, and you want to have something that prevents you from copy-pasting from one domain to the other without triple checking what's happening. All these things. But once you have these domains, which are not defined by the guy who writes the program that runs the domain, but defined by the user, once you have these domains, you can hook some of the domains that, uh, that matters to uh, uh, worldwide storage providers. For instance, your, your, your bank accounts and Bitcoin, whatever, you want them to be super encrypted and replicated 10 times over with an end to M if, uh, scheme. I, I need uh, N of them to know the answer. Uh, out of M, so, so I can get the, the memory back. But you can have all kinds of wild schemes differently for a different domain of persistence. And the data that you store this way has no reason to ever be lost until the end of civilization itself. There's no reason why the data you write should be lost. Another design principle is that the, the end user who knows his needs is the one who must, who must be able to specify what he wants. And the programmer who does have no clue what, whatsoever what the end user will want should not be forced to specify anything about it because he has no clue. So each can specify what they know, no need to specify what they don't. In, in Yahoo systems, sorry, my, my friend N tends to call our systems Yahoo systems. You have fractal transients. Maybe some modern app will save configuration for you without you ever pressing the save button. That's a great innovation in the last 10 years. Woohoo! But <laughs> underneath, it's all transients at every level. Even these apps don't save over the cloud or don't share. They don't have a notion of domain of presence. And when you log in from another device, will have different preferences. Or some preferences will be shared, others won't. It's a big mess. Uh, the programmers have to deal with very complex protocols for serializing, saving, transacting, upgrading, converting. It, it's horrible at every level, except maybe in a very su superficial and uh, brittle way for the, for the end users. Of course, the, the end programmers can't handle the configurations that matter to the end users because they have no clue who the end users are and what are their needs. And the end users, who is ultimately responsible for his own safety and his own uh, welfare, he's responsible for it, but he has no tools because uh, all the software is closed for him and he cannot do anything. So we have fractal transients, transients at every level. Everything is broken, snafu. Uh, what's snafu already? Situation normal, all fucked up. And I call that a disaster of Homeric proportion. You, you may think that the joke is on me for compulsively typing Control X, Control S. Yes, the joke is on me. But the joke is on N and everyone else. My, my friend N, since she, she, she was uh, rescued, she was typing uh, using Microsoft Paint to, to draw these weird uh, Huynam symbols to writing system, I don't understand it. And she, she had written probably the, the greatest epic ever written by Huynams in, in ages because she had been through so much stuff, like being enslaved, traveling to foreign lands, discovering foreign computers. She had been through so much, she had written some heartfelt thing. To me, it's just winning, you know, it's like, oh, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> To, to Huynam, I'm sure it was the greatest epic ever, and it's all lost because he never clicked on save. He just uh, writes, erase, write, erase, write, erase, and never saves. She just assumes that you can always go back in time as in any decent system. But no. But it's just not my friend N. How many Homeric sagas have been lost because people don't save or forgot to save or forgot to make a backup or had to spend hours and hours writing stupid systems that save things for you? Like, Maybe thousands of man years have been wasted. Maybe millions of man years have been wasted because systems don't have per, um, orthogonal persistence. And this is despite the fact that um, Eumel had orthogonal persistence in 1978, I think. Um, it's German system. You should read about it by Jochen Ditka, the guy who wrote L L3 and L4. Okay. So some perks of orthogonal persistence beside persistence itself. You never lose a session to a crash. How many of you have opened too many tabs and had the browser crash and then had to cry and then installed a browser extension to remember your tabs? How many? <laughs> Raise your hands. Okay, okay. Sure, but, well. 
So you, not just your, your, your tab, not just the URL of your tab, but all your session state can be preserved by orthogonal persistence. So you never lose data. Also, you have infinite redo and undo. Sometimes you do something and you want to undo it. And in most apps, you can't undo. In some apps, you have undo to one, two, three, uh, ten levels, or maybe up to a fixed size buffer of one megabyte of activities, something. And it's very, very, very difficult for the, the programmer to get that right. A lot of effort, and yet very little return on investment for all these efforts. But with orthogonal persistence, you have eternal instant replay. Oh, I did something. I can go back in time and just replay it. By definition, everything is in, uh, instant replayable. So if you have your Facebook feed or the Winem equivalent, and Facebook starts to display something you, you want, you click on it, and then the it item below you like it too, but it's too late to have clicked. You go back in time, and Facebook displays you something else. Well, too bad for you. You'll have to dig through it to find what it was. But in an orthogonally persistent system, it's there. You can just go back. People can never undo things under your feet. If someone deletes your comment or deletes a comment they wrote, but you ever saw it, maybe they did it on their computers, but it, they can't delete it on your computer. Everything you saw belongs to you. You can search it. You can analyze it. It's the opposite of Yahoo systems, where everything you do belongs to your credit card uh, processor who knows more about you than you do. So yes, data belongs to the user and not to someone else. I see someone here who, who is very happy. <laughs> One disadvantage of uh, orthogonal persistence is deletion is costly. Indeed, when everything is basically a persistent log, log, if you want to undo something, oh, I, I typed my password there, or I gave up some secret information, how do I delete it? Well, if you really want to delete it, you can, but then you have to rewrite all the logs since then. You have to do an Aurelian retcon thing where you retroactively, and that's an evil thing, and you, you have to better be very uh, trustful of your system to write new logs correctly. You better test the thing a lot, it requires a lot of testing. It's an ir irreversible operation. You better be sure what you're doing. And of course, you would never uh, delete other people's copy when you do it. You only delete your copy, not the NSS copy. But on the other hand, if all you care is not see this thing, like this was very bad porn, or this is like a, a friend I want to, to forget, uh, you can just de-index them. You never see them again. They won't appear in your in your thing, and th that's, that's cheap. The indexing is free, or it's just, but deleting, real deletion is very costly, and it should be. So in um, orthogonally persistent system, the primitives are not mutable records, they are immutable facts. Work for programmers. At least 30% less code, was, there was an old, old IBM study that said at the time, 30% of the code was just to deal with serialization, deserialization, saving, restoring, and that was not even counting any advanced error recovery. Just basic saving, restoring, communicating the things. And so all these can disappear. 30% less work for everyone here, except those who, of course, implement orthogonal persistence as, as this guy there. <laughs> so one thing is, in, in an orthogonally persistent system, there is no safe primitive. Everything is saved. Of course it's saved. We don't have to save it. There is never a save instruction. Instead, there is don't save primitive. When I'm going to display this uh, high resolution pictures at uh, uh, 60 frames per second, I will tell the system, hey, you know what? Don't save that. Put it in a domain that's not actually persisted because it doesn't matter. So there is no save primitive, there is a don't save primitive. And another perk for programmer, you can experiment without fear. Oh, what happens if I run this program that I just downloaded from the internet? Oh, it does rm dash rm slash. Ah, on. No big deal, go back in time. You know, uh, you can experiment without fear. Also, all bugs are 100% reproducible by default. If you do a very low level program and you insist on hitting the hardware, or if your hardware has a, a bug, the hardware itself has a bug, or your kernel, if something very low level has a bug, it might not be 100% reproducible. But if you write above the uh, normal uh, layers of abstraction, then yes, of course, it's reproducible. Duh. Uh, everything is deterministic. It's reproducible. I have a bug. I can reproduce it. I can debug it. No problem. Last thing is that you will think in terms of abstractions, not of bits. In a Yahoo system, uh, you think in terms of files that are sequence of bytes that are uh, themselves sequences of bits. And everything in the end is bits. The, 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 the only 
common interface between two different programs is bits. Sure, while you write into your programming language, you write using objects, integers, whatever, but as soon as you have anything that persists and anything that's important persists, you have to deal with bits. In a, a Huynam system, you deal with your abstractions, not with your bits. So you don't implement from the bottom. Uh, when the, the way that Yahoo's do meta programming and metaprogramming, they have to specify everything from the bottom. And there I also look at this guy because I think he got, gets it wrong. Uh, from the bottom means that you have to care about a common attraction to all your end users. You, ha you have to assume, well, all the end users will have is Windows 7, or all they will have is Linux with a kernel 3 dot whatever. And I cannot really trust <laughs> of anything above that. So I will have to specify my software as this big, this big pile of abstraction from this bottom to, to the, the, thing, the place where I want to be. And Yahoo's have meta programs, but most meta programs for Yahoo's are things that are just at compile time. Like meta programming is just like generative programming. And sometimes they have some runtime stuff, but it's horrible, very low level kludges, and you're guaranteed to, to break things if you use them. And in practice, Yahoo's only use it for debugging. <coughs> Like you can use ptrace, or you can use a kill, or things like that on processes. Like it's a tool just for system administrators and programmers who do debugging. It's not a tool for everyday programming because it's so fragile. And the last thing about Yahoo programming metaprogramming is all the abstractions are leaky. When you write uh, a program, it's written in C or in Lisp or whatever, or in Haskell, and suddenly you drop down to something underneath and your program breaks because you have a space in your file name or your program breaks because you parse a URL and suddenly there's magic code that runs code on your computer and takes over. So all your abstractions are very brittle and leaky and basically you can never be sure of anything. Queen metaprogramming and programming is done at as high level as possible, but no higher. No higher is very easy because you try to write a program, you see there's, I want to go beneath the abstraction, I can't. So it, it's, the program will tell you when, it, when you're at too high a level of abstraction. So no, not higher. And then every program you can write on top of its own DSL. And the meta program is whatever is underneath that DSL and implements it at compile time, but also at runtime. And very importantly, who names have full abstraction. Full abstraction is the idea that a program can never see what's underneath. There is uh, the magic, the, the veil is uh, rigid. You cannot see the man behind the curtain. You cannot, uh, at least the program cannot see the, ma the man behind the curtain. You cannot see the, the turtles under, under you. The program is fully isolated by the, the layers underneath. Very important, like, if you have to remember anything, any one thing from this thing, uh, this slide, is that full abstraction is super important. Of course, your program can explicitly allow some non-determinism. You can say, hey, this program, I don't really care whether you evaluate arguments from left to right or right to left. Here I want, give me any, give me any file. It will give you a file. Or if give me an integer, it will give you an integer. And as long as you say, I don't care, then you don't care. If you lie, that's your problem, but the, pro the, pro the, the, the system is allowed to do the things that you say you don't care to, uh, if it does, and he's not allowed to do things that you don't say you don't care if it does. So once you have full abstraction, you can do something very cool called program migrations. So those who missed the thing I did before, that's okay. I have another uh, talk from... Uh, Boston Haskell last week that you can consult. So program migration is basically when you change the underlying meta program under the program while it's running without restarting. The obvious thing is when I run some program on my uh, phone and I decide uh, it's too slow, let's run it on my laptop. And then I decide it's still too slow, let's run it on my desktop or on the cloud. And you don't have to stop it. You just say, hey, uh, just migrate there. And this is possible because there is full abstraction. Therefore, it doesn't matter if your program is currently compiled for ARM, I can recover the abstract state, and this abstract state I can transfer to x86, and there's no problem there, or from x86 to whatever the cloud provider is running. But it's not just for changing the uh, CPU underneath, you can also ch change things like uh, IO devices. You can say, this program is currently uh, connected to this sound output or this console output, and I want to rewrite it, uh, re re rewire it. 
I can do that while the program is running. Hey, program, you are not running on this screen or this um, uh, window. You are running on that window. Persistent, your persistence policy, your speed, latency, robustness policies, your optimization levels, everything is, can be a matter of choosing the meta program underneath. And you can also do uh, tricks like, hey, every time I, I type A, there's a bug. So when I type A, I will uh, trigger omniscient debugging or time travel debugging, depending on how you call it, same thing. And I type A, now I en enable a low level type tra uh, travel debugging and I, then I can see what happened and explain exactly what happened. You can also think of garbage collection as migrating the object graph. Garbage collection is, is a matter of having um, a programming language that conceptually does graph writing. And when you do graph writing, you don't care at what address a particular node is, all you care is that in the abstract it's a graph. And then your graph in memory is represented as some nodes is at, our, at our given addresses and garbage collection is just migrating your node representation from one representation to the other but the abstract node remains the same. And when you have this notion that you can change the meta program under a program without restarting, a lot of things can be simply implemented that way that are very, very uh, difficult to implement if you don't have full abstraction. And I know people who do that at a very low level, but what I want is to do that at a high level. And when you have all these features, everything is different in a Huynam system than in a Yahoo system. There is no impermanence. You never have to care whether your things are saved or not. They are saved. You still have to clean up, uh, clean up discipline. You still have to care to not uh, store your 4K pixel 50 times per second in your store or you will pay a big uh, bill in uh, uh, storage fees. You don't have to worry about by sequences, but you have to still to worry about object boundaries. If I want to share this part with, who do I want to share this object with or this part of the object with? What persistent policies do I want at, at what boundaries? You still have to think about object boundaries. You still have, you don't say files, but you still have to worry about which version of the file do I want other people to see? Which version of my program do I want to be compiled? Certainly not the one with an in, in intermediate state, but some of them are, you still have to think about release management. I don't have to worry about file names because everything is saved but I still need to worry about data indexing. I still worry, have to worry about better way to, to find the data than remembering, oh, I did that on Tuesday at uh, 4 a.m., so let's uh, scroll back then. You don't have to worry about startup scripts because the system never starts more than once. It, it just is. But you still have to worry about configurations and differences. Oh, this guy has a cool thing on his uh, machine. I want to replicate it. Can we diff, uh, identify the meaningful disk between the two that will make his cool features appear on my machine. You don't have to worry about finite access rights like uh, Unix or WX uh, crap, but you still have to worry about capability, access capabilities that are relevant to whatever domain you're implementing. So the common point is you don't have to worry about the low-level mechanisms anymore. Yahoo systems they are focused on the devices and the software and the things and the capabilities of those things. And you build on top of that. In uh, the Huynam approach, you first focus on the abstract things that you care about. You really care about which data you want to save and which you don't want to save, who you want to share it with or not. You care about the abstract interaction that you have with the data and with other people. That's what you care about. And then you, you, then you take care of that. So it's a different approach. You report things from the top instead of from the bottom. What happens if you have bad memories? Since everything is persistent, what happens if I make a mistake so serious that the entire system is garbled and forever? I do an out of memory error, I do a fork bomb, I have a deep meta bug where the compiler is so hot that the code that it generates for system calls or something very basic is wrong and I can't restore it. What happens if I garbled my store and the, the code that stores data is itself corrupted and stores zeros or, or random strings instead of the actual data? Well, the first answer is try not to do that. It's bad. What happens if I have a bug in GCC or a, ba a bug in my Linux kernel or a bug in some device driver? That's bad. Yeah, yes, bad things happen. Try not to do them. <laughs> And since they do happen, even if you try not to do them, you better keep all snapshots. You better keep your backup. You better have regular drills for backup and, and restoration because a backup that you never restore is as good as nothing. And you should make sure that you don't do anything 
that are irrelevant for your needs and that can only introduce bugs. The, the less you do, the better. And you use watchdogs to automate things for you. And automating things for you is possible in the Huynam system because there is this top-down view of I, the system knows what it's doing. Whereas in a low-level uh, Linux or Windows or Yahoo system, trying to do a backup uh, has so many ins and outs. Since the system does not know what you want to do, uh, should I it never knows what it has to back up or restore, and it requires a lot and lot of configuration that is different for everyone, and there is no solution, no general solution to back up in a, in a Yahoo system. There, there is a funny story uh, uh, that uh, Queen Ames tell each other from the bad old days. So in the 80s, there was a system in East Germany, Oimel, that was, had orthogonal persistence, and once in a while, someone would do, would do something that would hose the total system. But since at the time computer was very slow and disk was slow and they were using floppy disk for persistence, if you can believe that. Uh, I'm sorry, did you say East Germany? East Germany, Eumel. Jochen Litkov was from East Germany, so far as I can tell. So uh, sometimes someone would hose a system, like very bad, beat, deep bug. And what they would do is that they would turn the power off. And then all the other users would be angry, like everything I did in the last five minutes was lost. Okay, but at least I didn't destroy the system where everything would be lost forever. The problem with that is that since uh, the 80s, the latencies have dropped to five seconds, from five, second, from five minutes to five seconds to five milliseconds, then you need to be very fast to pull the same trick. So you can't use that trick. So if you can't use that trick, what you do instead is you, drop, you escape to the meta system. What is the meta system? If you've ever used an old 8-bit console like an Apple II or any 8-bit console, at some point you can either hit a reset button or control C or control something and you are dropped into the, the monitor. It's a very simple system. All it can do is things like peek and poke and call and inspect memory, things like very simple things. But you can do everything. From these simple things, you can do everything. So in a reflective architecture, you drop into this monitor that has a small reserved part in memory and then you can merge back the system log up to the point where you think uh, it's still safe. And then you can try to identify and try to, to restore from a safe point in the past and drop or, or put aside the, the logs, the, the changes that you don't want. What happens if there's a bug while you're debugging? You're in the monitor, so you, you, you've used that reserve memory and now there's a bug. And are you done? No, because the first thing you do with this monitor is to virtualize itself. So you have a small bit of physical memory that's reserved, but as soon as you have a, a lot of virtual memory that's reserved, you can use that virtual memory to virtualize the, the monitor, and then you can debug the system, but if there's a bug while debugging the system, you can still virtualize that and, and start over. And then you can use dichotomy to find where exactly the, the catastrophe happened and, and undo it. So really scary bugs happen, and you can't always avoid all of them, but you can eliminate entire classes of them. You can just prove correctness of some bits of your system or test it like SQLite does. If you haven't seen the SQLite test suite, like, it's mind-boggling. But there is one advantage that, uh, well, you can already do that with Yahoo system, so what's the advantage there? Well, the advantage is that in a Huynam system, most programs don't touch persistence. It's only very low-level programs, like the equivalent of their kernel and, and their compiler, that really matter for persistence. E everything else can just assume the persistence to happen. So deep persistence bugs can only happen with a very small attack surface. And that very small attack surface, you can prove correct or test like crazy. And that's something you can't do for Yahoo. For Yahoo, uh, since you implement everything from the operating system up, every program, by definition, can corrupt your file system and do anything. There's no way to uh, avoid it unless you do a lot and a lot of um, virtualization and sandboxing, etc., and then your programs don't work the way they should, and uh, it's actually uh, not a Yahoo system anymore. So either you're going all the way to the Huynam system, eventually I hope they'll do it, or you remain Yahoo and things don't work. Of course, the, f the real fallback for Huynam and Yahoo alike is just to keep and test your old backups. There is no there's no way around that. You can make the likeliness, you, make, you may make that cheaper and the likeliness of having to use it uh, lower, but in the end you still have to have backups. One thing that's interesting is that virtualization is just like branching. You can imagine that your entire system is just like a Git 
a gate system where everything, every keystroke, everything you do, but at a high level, is recorded in the system. And when you virtualize something and decide to only keep things up to that point and then diverge, it's just the same as branching in Git. <coughs> then undoing a very bad bug is just like rebasing in Git. It's like the Orwellian rewriting history. Of course, there are things you can't undo, like you can't unprint your data sorted printing like 10,000 pages of uh, gar garbage, or if you launch a few missiles, it's hard to undo. Maybe you can uh, pay reparations to the guy, declare peace. No, we didn't de intend to destroy your plane. Something, but something can't be undone, but that's not specific to Huynan system. That's specific to computing in general. So you still don't want to do the bad things, but at least the bad thing you do inside your system can, can be undone and easily. And once again, as far as virtualization goes, what matters is not hardware acceleration. I mean, it's good to have hardware acceleration, but what you really need to have virtualization is full abstraction. If you have full abstraction, you are guaranteed that replaying the log will be faithful, uh, will do the same thing or something equivalent the second time around as it did uh, the first time around. If you don't have full abstraction, anything goes. You're, you're, you can save all the events that doesn't guarantee that you will retrieve the system you had. So full abstraction is once again the big thing. It means the higher levels can't see the implementation specifics and that essential difference between Yahoo and WinM systems. And it's not a property of your hardware. It's not a property of your language. It's a property of your system. And to a WinM, a leaky abstraction is not just a top priority bug. Th th they happen. Sometimes you really make a deep bug in your kernel or something. Leaky abstractions happen. But when they happen, it's not a top, top priority bug. It's a security issue. And if you see someone trying to break abstraction in your system, you call the cops on them. And unless they are a penetration tester that you paid for, you, you should get them in jail forever. <laughs> so uh, a first-class computing system is what you end up if you take full abstraction seriously. First-class computing system means that you don't have just full abstraction for one level. There's the system and there's the things underneath. Instead, you consider that Every program that anyone wants to compute is its own computation, its own comput computing system. And it's not just a programming language. It's a programming language plus the runtime execution state. It's not the static semantics of your system. It's the dynamic <coughs> operational semantics of your running program. When I change the meta program under a running program, I care what was the running state. I don't want to just restart the program with an empty state and reset it. I want to preserve the current state and do something else with it. So, this notion of the program with its running state at the level of abstraction that I care for, not at the level of abstraction of bits and uh, x86 instructions, but uh, at the level of abstraction that I care for, that's what I want to preserve. And then I can move it from x86 to ARM or whatever. But it's because the system knows, has a, a first class notion of computation where it knows what program I care for at what level of abstraction. So every program is its own computing system, and then you realize there's not a one true global computing system. Most Yahoo systems are, has this notion that there's a one global computing system and you do all your side effects in it. You have a big shared <coughs> file system for everyone, you have a big shared whatever for everyone. For, um, for who name it's just if you ha only have global variables. At some level of your system, you only have global variables. That's obviously stupid. You want to have local variables, you want to have scoping, you want to have a system where you can locally do something, it will be isolated and you are the one in control of what happens where and what interactions are visible by whom. So I have a talk about first class computing systems there. It's, uh, I gave it at uh, Boston Haskell last week. This is a short URL, I hope the video will be, ha uh, will be online soon. And it's having not rigid tower, so the in Yahoo system, you have this rigid tower from the common level up to your program, and all that is your deliverable. You deliver a binary that has all that. In a Huynem system, instead, you deliver stackable modules. You deliver just this abstract computation, and you can, doesn't matter what's underneath, actually, you can change what's underneath at runtime. So obviously, I'm not going to deliver a, a binary that has everything that's underneath. I d deliver a computation that j has just something, just this top level part, so the part that I care about. And then you can restack them and change them. And so Yahoo, Yahoo's have operating systems where they have a privileged kernel that does everything and you build on top of that. Instead, WinNames have dynamically relink relinking of meta programs. If I want to talk to a sound card, I will not 
talk to a sound daemon that then talks to the kernel that then talks to the sound card. If I want to talk to the sound card, I talk to the sound card directly. I bleed directly into its memory. Uh, why is it correct? It is correct because at compile time and link time, I make sure that I'm only using trusted functional programs or whatever that, are, uh, that will not do out of memory errors or uh, out of bounds uh, or anything. I have full abstraction. I can trust my compiler to do the right thing. Therefore, I don't need anyone between me and, and the sound card unless I explicitly want to share the sound card with someone else, so I still need a protocol for sharing, but I don't need a kernel at runtime between me and my resources. <sighs> Quality instrument software. Persistence, robustness, security, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Yahoo programmers often dismiss them as non-functional requirements because they think, oh, the program should do this, so these are the scenarios, and the rest is just like, stuff we can add on later, like we can add security later, or we can add robustness later, or we can add persistence later. And unhappily, everything, it's, what they add, it can never be robust, it's horrible, it never works. And to Winems, these are not non-functional requirements, because the requirement is not to have a, 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 an artifact, it's not what is easy for the artifact, and first the artifact must do this, and then it must have some other properties. The artifact doesn't matter to, to what, what matters to a Winem is the interaction, and the artifact is just a means to this interaction. And persistence, robustness, security are not features, or features of the interaction. They are not features of the artifact, but they are features of the interaction, and they are part of the functional requirements of this interaction. So you have a very different approach, and that leads to a very different uh, outcome. And trying to make your artifact easy at the expense of your interaction is basically sacrificing the ends to the means. Making it easier to write programs so you don't have to worry about persistence is uh, absurd. Turtling down. So you can think of a runtime met metaprogramming architecture like Quinems have as in terms of turtles. You have your program that you care about and underneath are turtles. So you care about some level of your programs and you don't really care what turtles are there. But sometimes you do care. You want to debug or you want to add some properties to your program. So you pop up the, the turtle. You pop up some turtles. Or you, and then you can let the system change as it wants the turtles underneath. And you can decide exactly at which level of turtles you want to, uh, to care about. And you can change that dynamically. Which means that in, in Huynam systems as opposed to Yahoo systems, you don't just build up, you build down. In a Yahoo system, you, you take components, you compose them. Composing, we're in a, a functional programming conference, we like to compose stuff. We talk from things and we build stuff on top. But it's very important to build up, but the thing that we never do or we fail to do is building down. Building down is having an existing program and changing the implementation underneath, changing something underneath. And popping these turtles up and changing the turtle and popping the turtle, turtle back down. Things like that. And that's what Yahoo's can do, and that's what Twinems can do. And neither libraries not, nor servers will allow to do, you to do that. It's some, not something that you can retroactively fit or emulate in a, in a Yahoo system. The only way to have it is to have your Twinem system and your system design as a Twinem system. There is no kernel. There are lots of things. Lot, so Twinems don't have kernels. They directly talk to the hardware, etc. For something like access control, they, they transfer the ownership of the sound card, for instance. So do you want to, to handle the sound card? Here it is to you, now it's yours. And maybe your metaprogram itself will, will revoke your, your access and give this property to someone else. But all I know is I'm writing some sound and this sound will compile to whatever banging bits in whatever sound card there is or not. And actually if I'm not talking to a sound card, it can be all compiled to a knob and accelerated, yes, the sound is off. I'm not, I'm not even generating the sound because the sound is off. Uh, there is no apps. If you have something that has essentially one-way communication between the user and, and the program, then it's not an app, it's a document. Uh, for instance, a game is essentially a document. You explore the game. Uh, uh, of course, when, when you, scroll, you can scroll down, you can explore different parts of, of the document, but it's still a document, it's one-way communication. If there's both-way communication, if the user is contributing to the thing, then it's still a document. It's a document, 
but then you are editing it. So what you have is a document editing platform, something like Emacs, just less antiquated. And Yahoo's don't have to re-implement uh, their widgets because you can just say, hey, I want a file, give me a file, and your meta program will give you a file. And that will be all for everyone, so one minute only. Okay, so it's better division of labor because specialists will, will deal with the widgets and instead of having 100 apps which each have a bad widget, we have like three widget implementers in the whole world and just like in Emacs, you, uh, you have the correct widget uh, installed and the document developers don't have to, to deal with it. Okay, you can see how do we get there? Uh, there are so lots of technical and social problems, don't worry. Metaprogramming is programming programming and you can already do that. The, the main thing that, that, that's missing to have a Winam system is the vision and the will to make it happen. There is a nice misquote of uh, saint exupéry If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. The goal is not the system. The goal is a saner approach to computing, and you can already do it today and every day. Uh, main home points, think in terms of computing, not computers. Uh, value of level persistence, use reflective systems. And yes, it would be great if you condense the vapor wire into actual software, but uh, my, what I bring today is not just vaporware, it's not def definitely not software, but it's something else, it's wetware. It's changing the point of view about computing in your minds. Thank you.